Greetings everyone. Today on the bench I want to take a walk through an amplifier schematic. I think it's a pretty clever design. It's an older design, something I don't think we would really do these days, and I'll explain why as I go through the circuit. What got me started on this is my friend up in Michigan, his friend has one of these amplifiers. It's called a Tigersaurus. And he got it as a kit. And I don't think it ever worked right in there. Trying to get it working again. And through messaging, I've been trying to help out wherever I can. See if they can get it fixed. But like I said, a pretty interesting design. And I just wanted to make a video walking through it. It might be interesting to you. I don't know. The amplifier was designed in the early 70s by Dan Meyer, who had a company called Southwest Technical Products, and they made and sold kits. One amplifier they had was called the Universal Tiger, and he made more amplifiers using the Tiger in the name. So he came up with a high-power amplifier called the Tiger Saurus. Pretty high power, as you can see, it has a plus and minus 70-volt rail. So you can get north of 200 watts into an 8 ohm load. Well, the first interesting thing about this amplifier is that it's a fully complementary design from input stage to output. Something I probably wouldn't do today because to have low distortion, both the upper and lower part of this amplifier must be matched very well. If not, you'll have more distortion. Of course, negative feedback will clean a lot of that up. But before you close in the loop, you want to have as low as distortion possible. So looking at the input stage, it's actually two differential amplifiers. They're kind of meshed together here the way it's drawn on the schematic. But you see here we have a constant current source feeding tail current into this upper differential pair. On the collector, comes down here through a load resistor which allows a voltage in the signal to be passed on to this transistor. Then we have a constant current source down here feeding tail current in to the second differential amplifier. The collector on this side runs through a load resistor again allowing voltage and signal to be passed on to this transistor. Very crucial that all four of these transistors are well matched these current sources are delivering the exact same current. I would recommend 1% resistors in this stage because it is key for this amplifier to be balanced. This is the voltage amplification stage. Unlike conventional amplifiers where only one of the transistors are driven, usually the other side will be a current source or a bootstrap circuit. But like I said, in this amplifier, they're both driven. In between the transistors, we have the bias spreader circuit with an adjustment to set the current in the output stage, the bias current. Also, there is a diode for thermal compensation that's mounted on the heat sink. Next comes the output stage, and this is where it gets interesting. This output stage has gain. Normally, output stage in conventional amplifiers is just a buffer. This stage actually has gain, voltage gain, I should say, and I'll explain why in a minute. These two transistors are drivers, and in their emitter circuit, there are two resistors. And that ground point is drawn wrong. It should be between these two resistors. In their collector circuit are resistors as well higher value, so there is some gain to the stage. They are also taking some feedback from the output, but between the two resistors in the collector circuit, they're taking the signal off to the output transistors. Of course, same is true on the bottom. Well, notice that there are eight output transistors. Two of them, or the outer pairs, are driven from these drivers here, but how are these inner transistors driven? Well, if you follow their bases back, you'll see there's two drivers here. And then their bases connect to this line. This is connected to the rail. It goes through these diodes and a couple resistors. And that's connected to the output node. Same is true on the bottom. You'll notice there 
is no signal coming from these drivers, which gets its signal from the previous stages. So how are these being driven? Well, it's kind of a bootstrap configuration. It's driven from the output. Because like I said, this line here has no signal connection other than the output. Now in this line, you see two resistors of the same value. That will keep the signal halfway between whatever the voltage is, is on the output and the rail. And they probably use these three diodes to level shift it a little bit to fine tune it, I'm guessing. But the main point is that the voltage is split between these transistors. That'll split the power dissipation. And there's a couple reasons why this is done. Well, back 50 years ago when this amplifier was developed, these transistors they wanted to use would not support 140 volts across the rails. So if you had a large signal swing, at some point in the signal, you would have close to 140 volts across the output transistors. Well, these transistors are only rated with a breakdown voltage of 100 volts. So if they split the voltage between these two, that will keep them safe from breakdown. Also, you're splitting the power dissipation. So with such high supply rails, they'll operate within their safe operating areas. And to increase that further, they also paralleled them. So that's why we have eight transistors. Also in the output stage, we have this transistor and this transistor. These transistors are just for current limiting. In normal operation, they don't do anything. However, when the output stage is conducting heavy current, Enough current will pass through this emitter resistor and this voltage on the base will become high enough and turn this transistor on. You need about 0.6 volts to forward bias the base the emitter junction which turns this transistor on and then it shunts current away from the base of these output transistors and that will reduce the current. Now you see another resistor that connects from the base to the output node. That's there just to tailor when these start operating. So you might be asking, so why do we have an output stage with voltage gain? Well, if we go back to the early 70s, these small signal transistors probably didn't have high enough breakdown voltage for such a powerful amplifier and have the characteristics they wanted. So they had to reduce the voltage. And they did that by adding the resistors in the rail here and going through these series connected Zener diodes. There's two 36 volt Zener diodes and that would reduce the rails in these front end stages to 70 volt or 72 volts. So in the voltage amplification stage the maximum peak to peak swing you would have is just shy of 72 volts. Well that's not going to work if you have 140 volts across the rails you wouldn't be able to deliver the power designed for the amplifier. So because of that voltage limitation in the voltage amplification stage, you had to have gain in the output stage to bring that back up so you can get near rail-to-rail -rail output swing. So that, in a nutshell, is why they did it this way. Very clever design, I think. Like I say, it's not something we would do these days. There are issues with output stages that have gain or voltage gain. One problem is, depending on the design of the amplifier, if the amplifier is driven into clipping, it's possible to reverse bias the base emitter junction on these drivers, and that could damage them. Without analyzing this amplifier further, I don't know if it's an issue with this circuit or not, but it is one problem. Another issue I see with this amplifier is the lack of supply bypass capacitors. Not shown in the schematic, they have the two large filter capacitors, but still you're going to need some film or ceramic capacitors to help keep high frequency junk off the rails. So for example, if this output stage is driving a lot of current at high frequency, that's going to put a lot of ripple on these rails and it's going to go back into the input stages here and perhaps cause some instability. And I don't see any bypassing here. There's one odd thing I see is why with these resistors here that limit current so you don't blow up these zeners, why are they bypassing it this way with a capacitor? And this is shown drawn in backwards. 
I think it's actually a film capacitor, so it doesn't matter. But the way it's drawn, it's in backwards. But anyhow, to me, it seems like this capacitor should be from here to ground. Same down here, from here to ground. Okay, some final thoughts on this amplifier. Is there anything we can do to improve its design? I mean, without redesigning the whole thing. Maybe do a couple things here and there. But like I said before, we can look at the supply bypassing. We can also look at frequency compensation. I see we have this capacitor across this feedback resistor, which reduces gain at higher frequencies. In the voltage amplification stage, we have this compensation network here consisting of a capacitor and resistor. I believe that's called lag compensation. We can look at more modern ways of compensating the amplifier, see if that works better. Maybe look at Miller compensation. One issue with this amplifier is the output transistors are mounted on the rear of the unit where the heat sinks are. And there's quite a long distance of wires running from the board to the output transistors. Parasitic inductance in those leads can lead to oscillations. If you're experiencing a low level oscillation at a very high frequency, several megahertz, it's probably due to an oscillation around a local loop, which means around a transistor or two, rather than the, a global loop around the entire amplifier circuit. That would be a much lower frequency. Those can be tamed by adding some parts at the appropriate places in the amplifier. I don't want to get into all that here, but you know, certainly there's some things you can do to correct some of the issues of this amplifier. Well, I'm going to end it here. I hope you liked the walkthrough. Next video, I'll probably be talking about the 801. I got the schematic done on that. Just have to make a few changes and have boards made. And I can move ahead on that one. Plus, I have some ideas for even more amplifiers that kind of popped in my head over the last couple weeks. You know, that's something for the future. That'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching.